Hi, this is Kim from Khan Academy. Today I'm learning about the Eighth Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, which prohibits the government from imposing excessive fines and bail or inflicting cruel and unusual punishment on individuals accused or convicted of a crime. But what counts as excessive or cruel and unusual? To learn more, I sought out the help of two experts on the Eighth Amendment. John Stiniford is the assistant director of the Criminal Justice Center at the University of Florida Law School. John Bessler is an associate professor of law at the University of Baltimore Law School. So, Professor Bessler, why were the framers so keen to include the Eighth Amendment? Why did they want to protect these rights in particular? Well, these rights were actually uh, enshrined in the English Bill of Rights of 1689. And so when the Americans got into the dispute with, with Great Britain, they decided they wanted to have the same rights that uh, Englishmen had. And so it was not too surprising that when uh, George Mason actually wrote the Virginia Declaration of Rights in 1776, that he looked to English law to see what rights the English had, because he wanted exactly the same rights. And so this um, 16 words in the Eighth Amendment have been subject to a lot of controversy uh, over over the years. But I think one of the reasons that the founders wanted this was that, uh, like the English, who had had problems with the uh, monarch uh, imposing excessive bail, excessive fines, inflicting cruel and unusual punishments, uh, the founders also knew that was a risk that uh, there was abuse from the government uh, in the United States. And so they also wanted those uh, rights. Because originally in the Constitution, these rights were not uh, protected against. Uh, and the, uh, the Bill of Rights was ratified in 1791, which ensured that there would be protections against these uh, cruel and unusual punishments and excessive bail and excessive fines. If you look at the Eighth Amendment, there's three clauses, right? The excessive bail clause, the excessive fines clause, and the cruel and unusual punishments clause. And these all have one thing in common, which is that these are all penalties, essentially, that the government inflicts on people usually as the result of either being accused of crime um, or of being convicted of crime. So if you've been arrested, you're waiting for trial, very often your only way to get out of jail before, uh, before trial is to make bail. Um, and of course, after you've been convicted, the court might impose a fine on you um, or some other kind of punishment. And so the Eighth Amendment is designed to pre prevent the government from doing things that are excessive. You know, when the government punishes a person, um, that's the most coercive thing the government does short of war, right? Other than, you know, shooting you uh, in battle, um, you know, picking you up and throwing you in a jail cell is about as bad as it gets. And so uh, the framers wanted to make sure that we had a constitutional protection when it comes to criminal punishment. So in a lot of cases in the Bill of Rights, you see the framers reacting to some historical evil that they hope to prevent. For example, the Third Amendment says you can't quarter soldiers in private citizens' homes because that had been such an important tipping point in the American Revolution. Was there something that the framers had in mind as a particular historical evil that they wanted to prevent? Well, there, there, there was some uh, historical evils. And the English Bill of Rights went into place in 1689. And when that uh, went into place, there was actually a controversy in England around a, a person by the name of Titus Oates. Uh, Titus Oates was somebody who had um, made a false a accusation, uh, was, had committed perjury, resulted actually that allegation of the execution of uh, 15 Catholics. Uh, and uh, the, the plot that he had alleged was one uh, to assassinate the king of England. The question is what to do with Oates, right? Because as a as a sort of a moral matter, he's about as bad as it gets. In fact, in 2005, um, English historians voted him the worst Briton of the 17th century <laughs> and the um, third worst Briton of the last thousand years or something like that. So a very bad guy. You could think of him as a sort of a serial killer. Um, but the problem is that the actual crime he committed was the crime of perjury. Um, and even though his perjury resulted in the deaths of many innocent people, nonetheless, he could only be convicted of perjury, which at the time was a misdemeanor, which meant that he could not be executed for his crime. So when it came time for his sentencing, um, the judge, uh, Chief Justice Jeffries, who was a famous hanging judge from English history, says to, to Oates, well, Oates, we can't take your life, we can't take your limb, but we have something special prepared for you. Um, and it turns out that what they had prepared for him was, number one, a huge fine. They fined him like 2,000 marks. 
Um, they sentenced that he be dragged across the city of London while being flogged. He was dragged from Aldgate to Newgate while being flogged. And then two days later, just as the scabs were starting to form on his wounds, he's dragged back across the city of London from Newgate to Tyburn again while being flogged. Um, many people think the hope was that he would die from the flogging. But, you know, like a cockroach in a nuclear war, he survived. This punishment was actually a very severe punishment. And after the English Bill of Rights it was promulgated, uh, the Titus Oates' punishment was challenged. And some of the uh, members of the House of Lords actually called the punishment barbarous, inhuman, and unchristian, and contrary to the English Bill of Rights, and said that there was no precedent to warrant the punishments of whipping and committing to prison for life for the crime of perjury. This punishment was eventually remitted in the sense that Oates was later uh, released. Although the House of Lords refused to vote to suspend the judgment against Oates because they hated him so much. They said, you know, so ill a man shouldn't get the benefit of, of, of uh, any relief. But they all agreed that the punishment was cruel and unusual. And what, what's interesting is in the debate, they say things like, this punishment is contrary to law and ancient practice. Um, it is without precedent, and it'll be a bad precedent um, for the future. So in other words, um, it's cruel. And the way we know it's cruel is because it's so much harsher than has previously been inflicted for the crime of perjury, right? So the Oates case shows us that when the words cruel and unusual were first used, they were used to describe punishments that are harsher than the common law would permit or harsher than longstanding prior practice uh, would permit. Um, and this means that, among other things, the, the, the cruel and unusual punishments clause is not limited uh, to gruesome punishments like torture and the rack and all that kind of thing. Um, because, in fact, the punishments inflicted on Oates, although they were very harsh for the crime of perjury, were not as harsh as some other punishments that the common law permitted for other crimes, like treason. Wow. So that tells us a lot about the English context of cruel and unusual punishment. Do we know what cruel and unusual meant to the framers of the U.S. Bill of Rights? Um, so punishments um, were cruel and unusual, again, if they're too harsh in light of longstanding prior practice, for the crime for which they're inflicted. There's another problem with statutory law or with decisions of a judge or a king um, or a president for that matter um, that's also really relevant when we think about the Eighth Amendment. And that is um, sometimes the government um, gets really mad at someone. Um, they either think of a person as an enemy of the state and they want to inflict the worst punishment they can on that person, um, or perhaps they are there's a panic about a certain group in society. So, for example, in American society recently, there have been panics about drug crime or panics about sex offenses. Um, and every time that happens, the government tries to respond with new forms of punishment that are much, much harsher than what came before. Um, and so the insight behind the Eighth Amendment is that when the government wants to inflict a new punishment, you have to compare it against longstanding prior practice. That is, you have to compare it against the common law, right? So the common law was called the law of custom and long usage, right? Um, so if something comported with the common law, it was usual. If it was contrary to the common law, it was unusual. And that's where we get the phrase cruel and unusual punishments. It's basically punishments that are cruel in light of or in comparison to longstanding prior practice. So the basic point of the Eighth Amendment from a historical point of view is to uh, prohibit the government from innovating in a cruel manner, um, making up new cruel punishments um, in response to some actual or perceived provocation by uh, a criminal. When the U.S. Bill of Rights was, was adopted, uh, many years later, many decades later, they had their own issues that they were struggling with. And so the history shows that the uh, the American founders probably meant something different than the English meant because it was done over 100 years later. But no one knows exactly uh, what was meant uh, when they adopted that wording. To give an example, when the, the bill was debated in Congress, a delegate from South Carolina, a representative from South Carolina, said that he objected to the words nor cruel and unusual punishments because he said the import of them was too indefinite. And there was another legislator, uh, Mr. Livermore from New Hampshire, who said that the clause seems to express a great deal of humanity, on which account I have no objection to it, but as it seems to have no meaning in it, I do not think it necessary. What is meant by the terms excessive bail, he asked. 
Uh, who are to be the judges, he also asked. What is understood by excessive fines? It lies with the court to determine. And so that's really where we are today in a lot of ways. The court is still deciding, in this case, the U.S. Supreme Court is still deciding what the Eighth Amendment language actually means today. The modern case law, especially starting in the 1970s, revolved a lot around the death penalty. And so the question was, is it still okay to execute people for, for various crimes short of murder. Since the 70s, the court has continued to do that in a, in a number of areas. So it said you can't execute the mentally disabled anymore. You can't execute minors. Um, you can't execute anyone for a non-homicide offense. Although it's limited the death penalty in the name of current standards of decency, it's really not clear how the court has set about to determine whether a punishment meets current standards of decency. When the court is kind of on its own saying that a punishment uh, violates current standards of decency, despite the fact that most democratically elected legislatures actually approve the practice, then it looks like the court's acting as sort of a political body. It's sort of led the court to ignore what I think is the real danger of cruelty, which is that when there's a public panic and the legislature responds by ratcheting up punishment to new and unprecedented levels of punishment. And, and that's actually happened quite a lot in the last 40 years. And every time there's a panic, you'll, you'll, you predictably see the legislatures coming up with new um, uh, punishments that are much, much harsher than what came before. Um, and so, for example, with, with regard to sex offenders, there are now a bunch of states that actually impose chemical castration as a form of punishment um, for sex offenders. Now, castration as a form of punishment fell out of usage in the 13th century. Um, we're literally getting medieval on sex offenders, um, but the court can't do anything really to stop it, or at least hasn't, um, because uh, these are very popular forms of punishment. Um, you know, everyone hates sex offenders. The UN has actually decided that any, anything more than 15 days use of solitary confinement uh, should not be permitted. Uh, Justice uh, Anthony Kennedy actually raised the issue of solitary confinement in recent opinion um, he authored uh, for the Supreme Court. He actually raised the issue on his own at, at oral argument at one point, uh, talking about uh, how long people actually spend in solitary confinement in American prisons, uh, including, uh, including on death row. You have cases actually where uh, people are spending not just years, but sometimes decades uh, on death row in these kinds of conditions. Uh, Justice Breyer uh, just wrote a, a dissent in a case where uh, the person had been on death row for more than 40 years, so literally four decades uh, in these kinds of uh, very harsh uh, conditions of confinement. Uh, other countries um, have decided that that is not something that they want to uh, permit, uh, and they've actually set, set out a rule that anybody that's on death row for a certain number of years, for example, would have their sentence commuted to a, a life sentence because of the psychological aspect of uh, sort of waiting uh, for one's own, uh, own death. In the Bill of Rights, this is the last of four amendments, actually, that are concerned with protections for the accused. So why do you think there's so much in the Bill of Rights about the justice system? Were the framers particularly interested in making sure that the accused had rights? Um, yeah, they were. Um, and in particular, Americans were very devoted to the idea of the common law as a source of rights, right? In fact, that's why we had uh, the American Revolution in the first place, was that England was denying to Americans common law rights, like the right um, uh, not to be taxed without representation in parliament, um, but also more specifically to the criminal law, they were denying them the right to uh, a jury trial in criminal cases. And so Americans wanted to make sure that when the U.S. Constitution was adopted, that those common law rights that had built up over time in England um, would be preserved in the new American constitutional um, order. And many of those rights had to do with criminal law, both, both criminal procedures um, and to some degree substantive criminal law and, of course, criminal punishments. And, and again, the reason gets back to sort of what I said at the beginning, which is that when the government punishes someone, that's about the worst thing it can do. Um, and because you know the early Americans who framed the Constitution were very powerfully concerned with liberty, they wanted to make sure the government would preserve their liberty, protect their liberty, and uh, not become tyrannical, right? And so one of the main ways that they wanted to make sure this happened was by limiting the power 
of the government to punish whoever it wanted to for any reason that it wanted to. And so we have a, a really the majority of the protections in the Bill of Rights have to do with the protections for criminal defendants. What about excessive bail and excessive fines? How can we define what kind of financial penalty is proportionate to a crime? The courts have said, essentially, they've looked at dictionary definitions. Uh, excessive uh, means more than is necessary. Uh, one of the core principles actually go back to look at uh, Beccaria's work in the 1760s. He talked about this idea of a, a scale of crimes and a scale of punishments. And he said that there should be proportionality uh, between the two. And so that proportionality principle is one that we're really still uh, wrestling with uh, today. Now, the point of bail is not to um, punish someone, but but rather just to make sure that they will appear at trial, right? And so the amount of money you have to impose uh, for bail doesn't depend so much on what crime you committed, but what your financial resources are, right? It depends partially on the crime too, but but largely on your financial resources. So the amount of money necessary to make sure that a poor man appears at trial is probably going to be much lower than the amount of money necessary to make sure that a rich man uh, appears at trial. And so it is a, it's a standard that depends partly on the nature of the crime, but also partially on the nature um, of the offender. I imagine that what seemed like cruel and unusual punishment in the 18th century might not be what we consider cruel and unusual today. For example, we don't do whipping as a punishment anymore. How has what counts as cruel and unusual punishment changed over time? The law really changes gradually over time, as you know. And, and so when you look back at history, they actually had a, a large collection of, of pretty gruesome uh, punishments uh, back in the uh, 18th century. And we had non-lethal corporal punishments. They used things like branding people. They, of course, uh, uh, were whipping slaves back then. Slavery was still around. This is uh, well before the, the Civil War ended, uh, the institution of slavery. And we also had things like ear cropping. People would, you know, get their ears cut off. In the Crimes Act of 1790, which was passed just the year before the ratification of the uh, Eighth Amendment, the uh, Congress actually authorized public whipping, uh, lashing of people, and it also authorized the pillory the same punishment that had been used against Titus Oates. So there, there, was, there was these non-lethal corporal punishments, and really the death penalty is sort of the last vestige of uh, a bodily punishment that the Eighth Amendment, um, the, the Supreme Court has read the Eighth Amendment to allow the, uh, the use of capital punishment. That issue is still a very live one before the Supreme Court. We're now seeing challenges about uh, lethal injection uh, protocols. We saw uh, a challenge to uh, a protocol in Kentucky in 2008. We saw one to uh, to a protocol in Oklahoma in 2015. These, of course, are things that the, the founding fathers would never have envisioned. Lethal injection typically involves a three-drug cocktail. So there's a barbiturate, which is supposed to put you to sleep. There's a paralyzing agent, which paralyzes your body and also stops your lungs from moving. And there's a heart-stopping agent. Give the offender all three, and they're supposed to die you know, quickly and painlessly. Um, but the problem is if the sedative doesn't put you completely deeply unconscious, then um, the other two drugs are likely to make you suffer quite a bit before you die. And so the question is, is this uh, cruel and unusual or is it not uh, cruel and unusual? Um, and to date, the Supreme Court has twice held that lethal injection is not cruel and unusual. And their main reason has been that um, the state's not trying to torture you to death. And so if, if maybe you're sometimes accidentally tortured to death, well, that's just too bad. Um, but it's not a cruel and unusual punishment. So the Supreme Court has approved various methods of execution. At the same time, however, the Eighth Amendment has been read to protect prisoners. So in general, the Eighth Amendment is sort of a protective shield that prohibits uh, prison guards from gratuitously beating up uh, inmates. It requires prisons to provide uh, some level of, of health care uh, to prisoners because they, they cannot get it themselves. They're sort of wards of the state once they're put in prison. Uh, it requires uh, inmates be, be fed and, and sheltered. So in a lot of ways, the Eighth Amendment is a protective uh, shield uh, protecting inmates. But then in the use of the capital punishment, it, it becomes what I like to call kind of a it's kind of a Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde kind of jurisprudence uh, that the Eighth Amendment has right now. 
So we've learned that the Eighth Amendment seeks to limit the power of the government in meting out punishment to people who have been accused or convicted of a crime. Although it's hard to tell exactly what constitutes excessive fines or bail, in general, it's accepted that those punishments should be proportional to the crimes in question. Today, one of the biggest debates concerns whether, or how, the Eighth Amendment may limit the death penalty. To learn more about the Eighth Amendment, visit the National Constitution Center's Interactive Constitution and Khan Academy's resources on U.S. government and politics.